we good to go? Yes. Good awesome. Good, good afternoon. Uh, today I will be talking about uh, how to build a reflection system in C++ using our VM Clang. I want to start with a little bit of story time. Wouldn't it be great if we could take any structure which, or any class for that matter in our C++ programs, plug them into a function, and get a JSON string out of that. So we might want to send it over the network, for example. Oh, so here's a little code snippet, a little example. We have a struct called user. User has three members. An ID, which is a UN64, a name, which is a string, and then a, a vector of strings called pets. We fill the structure with some data. We give him the ID of 42, we call him John, and give him his two really cute pets his dogs, Buddy and Cooper. Then we call a function called JSON stringify, and this function returns us a totally standard JSON string. Looks like that. It's a normal standard JSON object. We can pass it around, we can send it over the network, we can serialize it to disk, we can unserialize it, we can do a lot of things with that, what you normally do with a JSON object. So, how do we achieve that? We have a couple options here, and the easiest one is probably just to create an overload for every single type we have we want to serialize. So we do exactly that. Here's a little code snippet. It's basically the stringify functions. We have a serializer. We serialize the first element, the second element. We set an array, serialize all the array uh, elements, and the array, and then return the string. This is great, right? It's easy to run. Yes, it's easy to write, but what happens if you commit that code and you don't touch it for the next six months? Some member of your team comes along, adds a new member to the struct, but forgets that this function is a thing. He doesn't change it. So now you have uh, two things which should do the same thing, but they are of sync now. And this creates hard to track bugs, and there must surely be a better way to do that, right? So let's have a look at some other languages in C++. How do they do that? Here, we have c -sharp. This is pretty much the same exact code snippet, uh, just as rewritten as c instead of C++. We create almost the exact same class. We have ID, name, and a list, which is the equivalent of a vector in c -sharp. And we fill it with some data, the same data as we did before. And we call a function on it again, JSON convert that serialize object, and it returns a JSON string. However, we don't need to write any more code for that. This we can take this code, put it into an editor, put the correct includes in there, or imports, and probably put the, the, the code in a, in a main function, and we actually get a string out of that. No more work required. So, how does that work? Well. You might have guessed it. The keyword here is reflection. C sharp gives us complete access to all the relevant information we need to write a simple serializer to serialize our previous struct called user into a JSON object or an XML object or whatever you actually want to do. So let's have a look at that. Here is one of the main building blocks in C sharp to achieve that. Every single type in C-sharp, every single type, including fundamental types like int, has a function attached which is called getType. This function returns us a type, a, an instance of a type. But this type is different to the types we're used to in C++. In C++ we're used to types which are used in templates, like class T, and type T. Those types are only available at compile time. This type is different. This type it's completely available at runtime. We can pass it around, we can, modif we, can, we can read it, we can modify it, obviously, but we can do whatever we want with that. Let's have a quick look at the documentation of this type. And here's a little excerpt from the documentation. It's a lot of, lot of stuff on there, you're not supposed to read all of that. Um, we want to look at two really interesting functions here, and I've highlighted them. We have get fields and get methods. These functions do like, exactly as they say. They return an array of fields and an array of functions. 
So how can we use them? Here's a little example which makes use of that and just prints all the fields we have in our struct. This is the same variable which we created before. It's called user. We get the type, then we get all the fields of it, which returns an array of field info, which is information about the fields. <coughs> and then we have a loop, simple, simple loop here, which is the equivalent to for range loop in C++, which iterates over all the fields and prints some information about that to the command line, to the console. If you look at the output, it looks like something like this. We have the name, which is obviously of u in 64. Uh, we have the ID, which is obviously of u in 64. We have the name, which is of type string. And then we have the paths, which is of type list of string. This is great, because these are all the, the, the types and names of the fields we have in our class. But this is a C++ conference, right? We don't want to write C sharp here. So uh, let's write the same thing in C++, shall we? And here it is. This is more or less an exact replica of the code we've seen before in C-sharp. It calls a function called getClass in our case, and it's, it's not an Android function anymore. It makes it easier for us. It's also a template, because we like compiler errors more than the runtime errors. So if you, for example, have a type which is not reflected correctly, or which is not reflected, you would get a compiler error here instead of a runtime error. There's also one of the implicit design choices, which I will get to more in depth later, and that is we have now uh, not get type anymore, but get class. And here's a, pretty much the same thing. We get the array of fields, and we iterate over them with a really simple uh, for loop, for range loop. And we will take this as our sort of blueprint and design our C++ API around this. <coughs> By the end of the talk, this will be working, and also a lot more. So, how do we start? We start from the very bottom, and we will work our way up. We start from defining what actually a type is. And the, the type is reasonably simple. Um, if we think about it, a type is a name, and a type is a size. There's obviously, sure, there's some some behavior attached, like if you compare a float and, a, and an int, they obviously have different behaviors. But in, in, in essence, a type is a unique name, including all the, the namespaces, so fully qualified, a unique name, and it's a size. Uh, the size is basically the equivalent of size of. So if we have the size of operator of name, we would get the same, same answer here. But all available at runtime since size off again. It's just compile time. We can't put in a string in size off and get the size back. It doesn't work. Well, we would get a back, probably. Um, so next, we have class, since with that, we don't really not that useful, right? A class is a type, fundamentally, so we inherit from it. And we add some more properties here. Each class, if you think about it, has a couple things attached. One of them is fields. So we had an array of fields here. The other one is functions, so we had an array of functions here. There's one piece missing here, which is which I've omitted and is kind of optional, and that is constructors. Those are fundamentally different from functions in the way that, for example, you cannot take an address of a constructor, but you can take an address of a function. So for the completion's sake, we would have to add constructors here as well. But I've omitted it for simplicity. For simplicity. Next, we need to define the field, and we need to define the function. The field, again, is pretty straightforward, I guess. It's a type, since every field, if you think about it, as you define it in your struct or a class, you have to give it a type. You also have to usually give it a name. Uh, you can have anonymous fields, so in this case, it would probably be empty string. And you have the offset. And the offset is uh, maybe not completely obvious at first, but if you have a structure in C++, it needs to be laid out in memory. And they are usually laid out contiguously in memory and linearly um, starting with low addresses, going to high addresses. And that means that you have a struct user, and at offset 0, you have the ID. And ID is an int, and int is usually of size 4 these days. So at offset 4, you would have the string, which is the name. And then at some offset further, size of string, you would have the, the, the vector of pets, the vector of strings. And that gives us a pretty good, pretty good approximation of what a field is. 
And so next, we have our functions. The function fundamentally has a return value, so it has also a type and a name, and, and uh, no, it doesn't have a name, but a type. We will represent it here as a field, which is not exactly correct, but it's a good approximation for now. Um, parameters itself also have a type, but they uh, additionally have a name. So in this case, only the offset is more or less um, useless. We can set it to zero. And then next, we also have a name again. We can extend those further later on. For example, if you want to add um, an, an attribute to each function or to each property, we can say like um, an enum of attributes and can say, all right, this function is replicated. So every time you call the function, you call it on some network, uh, you, you send some network package to some um, other running program which does something else. Or you want to put a, a serializable property attribute on the on the field. So like, all right, this field needs to be serialized, this field needs to be serialized, and when you omit it, it's not serialized anymore. So you have control. Start with that. Right. So here we have almost the whole API on a single slide. This is all we need to represent our reflection data for now. There's a type, and we have the fields, the functions, and the classes. But there's one crucial part missing here, and that is get class and get type. Because we need somehow access to those instances of those types, right? We need instant we need we need the data. So how do we get the data? Well, first of all, the easiest way here is to actually just create ourselves. The same thing we did with the with the previously um, JSON column column stringify function. We just create all the reflection data ourselves because we see the problem in front of us. We can just write the required data in there. So like, all right, this is a type of int, name, ID, and so on and so forth. This is obviously tedious, and we will later replace it to generate it automatically. So here we have uh, our start again, just to remind you again. And uh, let's implement that class for the struct, shall we? All right, so here we have get class of user. It's returning a class pointer, and it's uh, specialized on the, on the user type. So we start off with just making the class a static, static member here, which is super easy, thread safe, it's great. Next, we just populate the fields array. This is the first field, give it the name, set the offset, using the offset of macro here. Same thing for the string, for the, for the name, and the same thing for the pets. Right, that's great. So we return a pointer to it, and let's compile. Great. Oh, crap. We get a link error. So why are we getting a link error here? Oh, undefined symbols. Hmm, something's missing. Can you see what's missing? We had a function call to get type of un64, of string, and so on and so forth, and then of, of, of the vector of string. Where do we get those? And those are primitive types. In C++, we have approximately two types of types, so two, two, two categories of types. We have the primitive types, which exists in, in the language by default, like int, char, long, float, double, and so on and so forth. Then we have record types, structs, classes, and unions. Every record type is generally constructed out of primitive types. So those primitive types need to exist. So we need to have a way to get those primitive types into our reflection framework and use them as a foundation to build everything else. Uh, you might have noticed that std string and std vector is not exactly a primitive type. But in our cases and for our intents and purposes, we are treating std string and std vector as a primitive type. Because those are intrinsically different types. They are containers. If you would reflect, for example, or would you, you, later down the, the presentation we will build a dumper, which will basically dump all the, the contents of the struct to the, to, the, the, to the console. And if you would dump the, the contents of a std string, you would get maybe three pointers pointing to, to something, or a pointer and two size t's, which is the length and the capacity. 
And this is obviously kind of useless, since if we quit the program, the pointer is invalid. So we want to treat those as fundamentally fundamental types. And if you see a stitch string, we want to see a string printed and not some pointers. So that's why we're treating them as primitive types. So let's implement get type for all our primitive types. Here's a really, really simple implementation of get type. This is already more than enough, which can be used for, for representing uh, an int as a reflected type. Same thing, we create a static type here, we fill it with our data, which is just int and size of int, and then we return a pointer to it. This is really, really simple, but unfortunately also slightly more complicated in reality. Since we need to have a way to represent a, a template of a template, std vector of std string. If we try to do that here, we, we can't do that since we cannot specialize based on std string as std vector of t. So to do that, we uh, use tag dispatch, which is a really nice solution here. And uh, thanks to Miro for that, he reminded me on Twitter to, to use that, and it's amazing. Uh, this way we can, we can specialize based on the class t of our vector and get access to the t and can implement get type for std vector. This is great. So with that knowledge now settled and with all our primitive types filled in, we will go back to the get class implementation and implement it. And here we have it. As you can see here now, we have get class impl instead of get class. Now we also have the tag again, which is this time called the class tag of user. <laughs> It's pretty much the same thing. We create a static class here. We fill it with our data, more data, even more data, and we turn a pointer to it. So this is now our class reflected, and we will turn and we'll compile. This is great. So the same thing is also needs to be done for, for std st vector and std string, since, again, those are treated as primitives and also are special and also are classes. So let's revisit our implementation of our little printer. <coughs> now, with get class implemented, we can just take this code and put it on an editor and hit compile. And we get the output of it. It's great. We get the ID, which is of type U64. We get the name, which of type stood string, and then pets, which is the vector of stood string. But it's all still manual work. We still need to do this. We still need to implement this get class impl for every single struct or every single class in our program, which you want to have reflected. And we don't want to do that. We are lazy, right? We want to have it automated for us. <coughs> so this is where LLVM comes into play. So show of hands, who has heard of LLVM? Pretty much everybody. So who has used LLVM? And, and not by, by using, I don't mean like using client, but actually using the framework. Well, significant amount of people, not bad. Uh, just to get everybody on the same same page here, LLVM is a compiler framework. It's basically a library to build compilers. It was created by Chris Latner in 2003 as I think type of his uh, part of his master's thesis, and it powers the client compiler, which is the main tool chain on macOS and I think Swift and uh, Switch and a couple other platforms. However. Just LLVM doesn't get us to where we actually want to go. Since the problem is LLVM is a very uh, low-level library, it doesn't know anything about C++. It knows about architectures like x86, sure, and ARM, but it doesn't know anything about C++. So that's where Clang, Clang comes into play. We will use Clang, and we will use a specific way of using Clang, which is called libtooling. A little tooling will allow us to parse C++. So we can take any C++ <coughs> and we get an AST, which is short for an abstract syntax tree back. Using this abstract syntax tree, we can now extract all the necessary information we have, or we need, and print all the required, or all the required code, and then compile it again. Um, the AST is really useful and it's used in many, many applications throughout the, the LLVM and Clang tool, tool chain or other framework. So, house question. How do this code generation thingy, this step? So since we have the AST, we know what we want, and how do we get the code or the, the reflection data into our program? There are a couple ways we could generate a database, we could try to embed it in our, in our binary. But I opted here for the really, really low-tech solution, and that is just to generate a header file. 
We all know how to include a header file, so this is pretty simple. This is the only manual step you actually need to do in the whole, whole framework here, and that is include the header file yourself somewhere. We will generate a header file for every single header file you will give us. So, for example, if you give us foo.h, I will, the, 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 the framework, the matter of fact framework here, will generate foo.generated.h. You can implement, uh, you, can, you should include that in foo.cpp, and then you have all the, the reflection data available to your program. And we will now take a look at the AST. So, we will write a little Hello AST <laughs> program, since we want to get a little familiar with the AST and how, how the AST represents our C++ program. Again, it's used by Clang to generate information, and it's used for all types of program transformation. We will dump down our struct a little bit. We don't use user struct to begin with. We'll use this, called, this little, tiny little struct called foo. It has two members, a volatile int and a float. Don't get hung up why it's volatile. I just want to have some modifier in there. And uh, let's start with dumping the AST of this little struct. And we can do that using Clang. <coughs> Clang is a little, little flag called uh, dash AST dash dump. If you pass that to the actual Clang front end, we get an AST dump out of that. And as you can see here, it's uh, a translation, tra translation unit declaration, a record declaration, uh, and two field declarations. And as you can also see, we see all right, struct foo, and volatile int, and float. Oh, they're called bar and bus. Awesome. So we have now uh, a structure in our C++ program, which represents our C++ program. It was great. So, but this is still Clang. So we got to build the same thing using our libtooling tools. Uh, at this point, I will assume that libtooling is set up. We have the exam, we have the LLVM ready, and uh, we can start digging into into how everything works. And to just start off, we start off small and we start off simple. We will just do the same thing. We just print all the the, the AST to the command line uh, to the to the console. And here's a little it's like the hello world of of working with the AST. It's a little program has a struct called dump AST action and then just dumps the, the AST to the command to the console. And it's pretty simple. It's a little just a lot of boilerplate. You, you can copy that later if you want to. Um, but let's just compile that and run it over struct. That's the way how we run it. We give it the uh, give it the header file name and some flags. It needs the flags where it can find all the all the includes and stuff like that. And it gives us almost the same output. That's great. So let's take our user struct because this is struct foo, which is kind of boring. It's just an int and a float. So let's take struct foo. Uh, struct user, sorry. Struct user. The struct we, we talked about the whole time. Want to see the results when we run that through a little AST dumper? Yeah, I wanted to show that, but I couldn't find a program which could actually render it. It's 106,000 lines of AST. It's a lot of code. Those headers expand to quite a lot of code. And if we try to further nail down how many records are in there, we can see that those are just 2,000 little structs or classes. Okay, this is getting quite large. Those have roughly over 1,000 uh, fields, and we definitely need a better plan here. That we, we can't reflect 2,000 structs in, no, that doesn't work out. All right, so what are we doing here? How do we do that? We need a way to somehow annotate all of our structs in a way that we can say, I want to have this struct and this field reflected. And we can use attributes for that. We can either use the C++ attributes, which are new with the um, angle brackets, no, with the, with the square brackets, sorry. Or we can use Clang's old underscore, underscore, attribute, underscore, underscore. And if we do that, we have something like that. Kind of noisy, right? We can now do the same thing and replace the underscore attribute with square brackets, opening, Clang, colon, colon, annotate, and square brackets closing. But it also has a couple downsides, which is you get from your compiler generally, hey, I, I, I haven't seen this attribute. I, I don't know is this attribute right or not. You get unused or unknown attribute warnings, and you generally don't want to disable those. So we just turn those into macros since it's C++, right? We, just, we like macros. 
<laughs> so um, we have our class and our property macro here, which basically just um, abstract away the ugly annotation. And then every single class in our program, which we will now have to annotate with our class macro or our property macro, will be able to be reflected. And we can now exactly use certain, exactly use um, AST finders or AST matchers to find exactly those fields and classes which you want to have reflected. This gives us completely fine-grained control over everything which we want to have reflected, and we can ignore everything which is outside that that, that domain. That means our little dumping example can become from 100,000 lines of AST to roughly 2,000, I would say. And this is great. So let's, let's build that, shall we? So here we have a little bit of code. We start off with the class finder and match finder. The class finder is our class, and we will implement that later. That is actually doing all the, all the work once we found stuff. And here's the clever bit. Here we have really interesting AST matchers. They have a little DSL in LLVM, which allows us to filter based on certain properties of an AST node. You can think of an AST node as a really dense package of information. And it has everything which you want to know attached. So in our case, we can say, all right, in the case it has an attribute of type annotate, we want to find it. And we want to bind it to the name of ID. So we can later still find it and interact with it. We do that for all the three types of AST nodes we're interested in. Records, also that means classes and structs. Fields and functions. Once we've created these measures, we can just add them to our finder. And then we uh, go ahead and implement our class finder. Since the class finder actually does the real work. The class finder basically has to inherit from, from the match callback and has to implement three little functions. The run function is called for every single match we have in our program. So every single time we have a match for one of our AST finders, uh, AST matchers, this function is going to be called. At the beginning of any translation unit, or header actually as well, uh, we get the on start translation unit. And on every end, we get the on end of translation unit. The on end of translation unit is going to be interesting later down the road. Keep that in mind. So, let's start with implementing our run method. Run method is reasonably simple. <coughs> we just go back here real quick. We get the match result passed in, which is just the result, which contains all our matches, or contains our match. Since the AST is kind of polymorphic, we got to figure out which type the, the match is, of which type the match is. We can do that by looking at the, at the match and then using the get no as function. And we try to get it as a CXX record decal, which is again, structs and classes. And this will, this also takes a, a string, which is our previously bound name. Just call it ID here for simplicity. If the node we found is not of type C6 record decal, we will get a null pointer back. Let me check that. If it's not null, we just call the found record function. The found record function we will implement on the next slides. And the found record function will, will do some interesting work. We do the same thing for fields, and we do the same thing for functions. It's pretty much the same. We just change the, the what declarations or what AST nodes we actually want to have. And in the beginning, we say, we just dump all the nodes out to the console again, since we just want to see if this, this code actually works. And to do that, we just implement found function, found record, and found uh, field as simple dumps. And we can do that by just calling the dump function on them. <coughs> Pretty simple. We'll do almost exactly the same as our previous dumping, just a little more complicated. And we'll dump our infos to the command line. Next up, we need to actually run it, since uh, we still have our example dummy matcher in there, uh, dummy AST dumper in there. To replace it, we just replace the, the tool in the end we actually run, which is why it's also called the tooling, because we build tools. And we just add our finder in there. Once we've done that, we can run the tool, and we now get all the relevant information which we can use to build our reflection system. 
And we run it, we get something like that. This is the old AST for. This is still taking our uh, 100,000 lines of code AST uh, header and running it through our now modified um, filtering reflection. And this is everything which we have. And this contains everything we need. And this is great. This is amazing. So, with that said, we finally want to do some, some real work here, right? We got to really implement something at once. And um, we've replaced the dumping now with, uh, with um, collecting all the information, collecting all the notes. Because we can only reflect everything once we've gathered all the information required. That means we can't start reflecting our classes if we're in the middle of the class and we haven't found any of the fields yet. Because that doesn't make any sense. So here, we just, for every single record we find, we create a new, new instance of reflected class, push it back in our m, dot m underscore classes vector, and then every time we find, we find a field or a function, we assume it's the same, the same class, and just let it back there. We will also save the, the file name here, which is what I've talked about before. We will uh, add dot generated dot hxx here. Uh, I, I use dot hxx and dot cxx for my C++ implementation files. And uh, therefore we also have the file name of our translation unit. It's not really too spectacular. So, but this is only run. You also need a end of translation unit and on start of translation unit. On start translation unit, as of right now, is empty. We don't need to do anything special at the start. But we need to do something special at the end of it. And that is, we want to finally generate some code. We've had a long journey till here. It's like 32 minutes in. And we haven't done any code generation yet. So we're finally reaching the, the point where the puzzle, we've, we've, we've had our thousand pieces puzzle, and we're having the last piece, and we're putting it in. And this is it. This is generating it. We will open the, an output string here, which is just the output file. And then, for every single class we found so far in this translation unit, we will call the generate function. And then we will clear the vector again and be ready for the next uh, translation unit. We could actually do that work in the on start of translation unit as well. So, let's get into the code generation part. The code generation part is actually reasonably simple, since in the end, we've had it working already, right? We, we wrote the code by hand, and we ran some, some simple example, which already gave us reflection information, which wasn't available before in C++. So what we now do is we basically take this, this code, which we've written by hand, put it on the left screen, and put our editor in the, in the main screen, and then just all the information in the code which we've written before, which we've hard coded, we, we identify and replace it with basically the variable code for every single field, or every single function, or every single class to generate. And we do that in a pre pretty reasonably simple way. We do that using our generate function. So we have our generate function, which we've called from the uh, on end of translation unit before. We do some setup here in the beginning. Uh, like printing the header guards, putting the namespace there, putting some license information there, for example, all the boring stuff. Then we reach the part where we actually want to implement the class. And this is the same thing which we did before by hand. This is our get class impl, same thing, class tag, and then we're putting the type on here. And the type is basically a string of our type name. And it's going to be the very same thing which we did before. Now we start off by a static class again, called C. And then we go, for every single field we have, we create a field generator, which is all the information about the fields, and we'll generate all the information about the fields. We iterate over the array of fields, and pass it in here. Uh, we are using ugly normal for loops because we need to have the <laughs> index here, instead of a fancy for range loop, and print all the information about each field. So once we've done that, we're going to look into the field generator, the generate function. It's reasonably simple, right? We, we only have to populate these three members of our field struct. And that is the type name, the field name, and the offset, which is still done by offset off, because it's still fine. We're compiling the code again. So with that said, 
But I don't know, quick demo of the actual code which drives all of this. So, hope this works. Mirror displays. You can see it awesome. So, that's the right one. We're going to go. We start here, and that is the little. Can, can everybody see that? In the back? I can make it larger if you want to. Perfect. Awesome. So here we have the very same program which you've seen in the beginning, which is CSARP. We have our user. Wait, we have our user. Here's our user. We have our user with an ID, a name, and a vector or rather list of strings. Then we create an instance of that user, and we serialize it to JSON, and we print it to the command line. Hmm. And we have our JSON object. So this is just just to show you that the code I've, I've, seen, seen, uh, I've shown in the beginning is not bogus. But the fancy part is when we do the same thing in C++. Here we have almost the same thing. You can omit the dump now. We're having our user. We're creating an instance of our user. We are pushing back our two, two docs. Now we're calling the JSON stringify function. And this is doing the very same thing. You're going to compile it, and you're going to run it. It's going to take a while. So here we have, as you can see, our JSON object again. So same JSON object we had before, with the only difference that we now have an underscore underscore type. You might wonder what that is, and that is a, a type hash. We can use that to deserialize our struct again. That means we can, from this type hash, if we take this, this JSON object, which is untyped, it doesn't, have, it doesn't say that this JSON object is a user, right? This type does attach this information. So if we take this, this JSON object now and deserialize it again and give it a user pointer, we can compare the, the hashes of the type names and say, all right, those two hashes match. Those are the same objects, we can deserialize it into a user and get a fully, uh, fully populated user object back. And with this fully popular, populated user object, we can do whatever you want to do, whatever you do with an object. Right. So, but this is kind of the expected part, right? Let's have a look at the actual implementation of it. Here we have our user. And this again is the same thing which we had in the slides. We have our class, macro, user, our property, in this case, I added the actual serialized uh, attribute here. So if I omit the serialized, I wouldn't serialize the ID anymore. And this allows me to have private properties on a class, which I still want to have reflected, but I don't want to have serialized. Since we might have a caching, for example, here, like say, we want to have the age calculated by some lazy calculation because it's really hard to calculate the age of this user and we want to cache that but you don't want to print it out or don't want to serialize it. And you can use the arguments here, uh, the attributes here. That is the generation or that is the, the, the definition of the, the declaration, sorry, of the class of the user. So let's dig into the, uh, let's first dig into the actual API here. And here you see the same thing as we had before. Our little macros, because we like macros. Um, in this case, again, reflect class, reflect class, reflect property, and then attached with a, with a string concatenation here, all the arguments you pass into this macro. Further down the road, we have uh, our public API, which has get class and get type. Those can be used again, to get access to the classes and the types. And uh, with that, we can, for example, dump it out to the console or do further work. Dump, regarding dump. I mentioned the dumping. And that is one of the features which I love about this little library. Imagine you're debugging something and you don't really do a build a printer for like an overload of operator, operator, the left stream, whatever that's called. 
And you don't want to do that for every single type you have. You want to have like, all right, dump it out. I want to see what the part of what, what actually is in this class. And this allows us to do to build a function which is exactly doing that. We can go back to our main and we can uncomment the uncomment the dump and comment in the non-dump and comment out the JSON. And if we now compile and run it, we can see that we can now say can now dump the user in debug information to our console, which is amazing. As you can see here, we have the user has an ID. This is unsigned long long in 64 of 42, then a string called with the content of John, and then the array with the two docs, Buddy and Cooper. That's great. Then we can do that for every single every single uh, reflected class or struct we have in our program. So let's have a look at the actual implementation of the types, the get class and get type. We can do exactly that here. Get class of user, and we will get a class back. And we can say like, I think we can print the name. Might be get name. <laughs> it's not get name. Also, we need. Oh yeah, we need the namespace. Right. And uh, let's have a look how it's actually called. We go to the matter of oh, wait. We go to matter of fact detail, and then we have class. Who the virtue of life demos? Here we are, class, and the name is called. Any guesses? Name. Oh, hmm. how boring. Awesome. We get the name. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe a little too excited here. <laughs> so we want to actually have a look at the actual implementation of it, right? So this is the implementation file. Uh, this is all the detailed implementation, which contains the definition of classes, of functions, of types, of fields, of parameters, and stuff like that. Um, and just to note as well, all this code can be found on GitHub. It's available right now. If you go to my GitHub, it will show it at the end of the slides. Uh, you can get this, and you can play with it, and it works. You, uh, I will also, by the end of today, will also give you an executable, which you can just run and uh, to make it easier so you don't have, don't have to have a lot of VM installed. Um, let's start with a type. It's the same thing as I did in the presentation, just a little more uh, complicated. And that is, it has a size, it has a hash, and it has a name. The hash is basically an FNVA1 hash, which can be calculated at compile time using a context per function, which is pretty cool. And uh, it's just a test here, so it's really similar, just a little more, more elaborated. We can also compare it, which is useful. So we have the same for field. Again, also has a type, has the flags attached, has the width attached, and the offsets and the qualifiers. The qualifiers are something which I haven't touched in the presentation yet, but we also obviously need qualifiers and, and pointer ways. So for example, if you want to define a void pointer, you can't say type and name because you, you can't define you, you, you can't define a, a variable called foo with type of void. You're going to have it either a pointer or a reference or something like that. And that's where the qualifiers come into play. In this case, we can see whether it's a, it's a pointer or a reference or a const pointer or a volatile pointer or a, vol or a pointer to volatile const, stuff like that. Next down, we have our function parameters, which in, in this case, I actually still use fields. Uh, our functions with return types, parameters, flags, name, same thing here. Enums, I gotta implement that at some point. And then there's the, there's, the, there's the fancy part which allows us to do the visitation stuff. And this is the more complicated stuff. 
which is a really large strut of virtual member functions. The dump implementation and the JSON serialized implementation both use a visitor to, to visit all the fields and then recurse deeper down to visit all the fields again of the struct, which if you have any, any less structs, to do all the printing. And this is unfortunately really complicated, but it allows us to do really powerful stuff like the dumping uh, demonstrated before. And as a, as a last thing here, we have the class, which is a little more compli complicated since it has to have the fields, the functions, a name again, also a base class and a type as well. So now you're probably looking forward to seeing how we actually implement the dumping or actually implementing the JSON serializer. And it's going to be interesting. We have our serializer here. The API for the serializer is pretty simple. This is a really fast function. It needs to be a template. It returns a stitch string and it does access the same information which we just did in the example before. It calls that class, gets a class pointer, and then calls the JSON convert function. This JSON convert function is containing all the magic now. So this is the dump visitor, and here's the JSON visitor. The JSON visitor is again inheriting from class visitor and implementing all the virtual abstract virtual functions. At the beginning of a class, we just print our beginning of the of the JSON object, which is just the type of it, and we start the object off. At the end of the class, we end the object. For every class member, we print the name of the class member and the column. And depending on whether we have already printed a field, we also print the comma. Once we actually get to the type of the of the field, we got a branch pretty badly. Namely here. JSON only has a single data type and that is double. So every single type we have on our C++ program needs to be converted to a double. That means we can now look at all the hashes of all the previous primitive types which we've defined and somehow convert them to double. And we do that by simply having a double called red here and then interpreting our instance, which is a void pointer, as the type of our type hash. And this returns as a double. Once we've done that, we can actually print it. Since for every primitive we now visit, the primitive function is going to be called, and we convert it to a double, if it has a valid instance, obviously. For every non-primitive function, for example, for every string, the string function is going to be called. And we will print the string instance here. For every array we have, we're going to call three functions actually. We're going to call an array begin function, which we can see here, which starts off the array. Then we're going to call for every array element we have the array element function, and then the array end fu function once we've done that. However, since you also want to go deeper, so if you, for example, have an array of um, state string or an array of struct user, we're going, to go, we're going to go recursive here. So we also call, say, the primitive function, for example, if we have primitives in our array, or the string functions, if we have strings in our array, or the, the non-primitive function, to de uh, go deeper. And that is basically all the implementation there is. This is pretty much all the magic. It's available right now on GitHub. Uh, you, can, you can find it under my GitHub name. And... Uh, I will now go back to the slides. All right, so now in the future, there are still a couple things left. This is this is really the bare bones of a of a reflection framework. This basically has everything you need to start building upon it, but it isn't fully featured. It's not something we can take and select standardize. It's something you can, you can build upon. It's built really simple, and it's roughly, I would say, maybe 3,000 lines of actual um, tooling code, and roughly 5,000 lines of library code, which you have to include. So it's really approachable, and I would 
encourage all of you to just have a look at that and maybe play around a little bit. It's, it's kind of fun and you can think of really nice um, use cases here. For example, I've used, I'm using this to generate SQLite queries from a struct. So I have a struct user and generate an SQLite query from that. Or I can also do the other way around, for example. We can say, we want to improve upon the data storage. Right now, we are just putting everything into static um, class member, uh, static function members, no, static function elements, whatever it's called. And um, this is going to end up in the, in the data section of our executable. If we have uh, lots of reflection information, we might want to put it into an external database, which you can load at runtime. Or we want to compress it and put it compressed into our data section so we can load it at runtime from our data section using, for example, some linker tricks here and there. And a lot of things around actually the usage of it. All right, thank you very much. Here you can find the links. Uh, this is the working implementation. You can find it on GitHub right now. I will put an updated version later today. Uh, this contains the version which uh, is stable right now, but contains all the features I've talked about. And uh, now uh, we have some time for questions. All right. Any questions? Uh, right. Oh, yeah. So how does it work when you dump a type name if a type is actually a type diff? How does it uh, yeah. expand it? Does it do all the things? <laughs> it does. All so the question was whether what, what happens if I'm, if I'm dumping the type name, uh, the name of a type. And yes, um, it basically creates a fully qualified name. As, as you've seen before in the example, I had a U in 64 underscore T. And the U in 64 underscore T actually became an unsigned long long. Since on my on my Mac OS, this is the, the data type which is behind it. If you put in std vector, no std string for example, you would get std colon colon underscore underscore one colon colon basic string of char probably. Um, yes, it's gonna be put into a fully qualified name since again a type name needs to be completely unique in a program. And this actually is one of the things which it's not exactly obvious from the Clang code how to do that. And there's some clever code doing, uh, in Clang you actually have sort of a tree of type names for a single type. So you can traverse the type name tree to get to the actual end of the type. But you also don't want to traverse it too far because then you end up with void. <laughs> or something nonsense. So yes, it's uh, one of the major problems which I had to tackle, which actually took a while. All right. Can we pass around the mic, please? Hi. Thank you for the presentation. Um, but uh, it, it seems to me it's rather sad that in 2018 we're still at the cute level of things. We have a separate <laughs> tool, a separate pass, and we have macros and uh, attributes. Now I I can understand I can understand the the need for a separate pass and a separate tool because the language doesn't give that give us those yet unfortunately. Um, but is there really no other way uh, other than imposing the macros and the attributes things? But for example, could, is it would it be possible to actually have the the entire dump the entire ST of a file and then do some queries like? Of, of filtering it, of finding the the type that you're interested in, interested in, because this way this is intrusive. You 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 have to modify right. other people's types. Right. So that's that's uh, the second question about the second part. Then the first part about separate tool tooling. Uh, do you perhaps know if Clang would allows us, or do they have plans to uh, to allow such a thing? to use the, this tooling functionality directly at compile time, if you're using Clang to compile, so that we can avoid both the separate pass and the macro thingy. 
Right, yes, uh, that would technically be possible. I, I'm not sure if there are any plans of that yet. Um, yes, we're still at the cute level of things. Unfortunately, we don't have any standard ways of reflecting yet. There are some cute ways, no pun intended here, um, of doing reflection using standard, uh, using um, structured bindings, which was touched in a previous talk before today. And um, you can probably modify Clang to the extent that if you compile Clang, you put your AST inside the, the, the binary and it makes it queryable. That is very possible, but the, the difference here is that this doesn't impose, well, it still requires that, you're yet, that your program is compilable with Clang, but it doesn't impose on compiler you, you use in your production code. If you, for example, prefer GCC or have to use GCC or some other um, compiler, proprietary compiler for, <coughs> for example, a microcontroller, you may want to use that and not use Clang since it doesn't have the support for it. Um, as far as proposals go, there are a bunch of proposals regarding reflection, and they are mainly regarding static reflection, um, which means it's allowed at compile time rather than runtime, which I have, which I have uh, had the goal to do. Um, given that we have static reflection, we can also implement runtime reflection on top of that, obviously. But to get in from all the proposals, I I don't have the time to summarize them now. Can we at least avoid the Intrusiveness, the attributes thing. Right. Well, we can avoid intrusiveness. We can, we can probably avoid intrusiveness. Yes. Um, there, are, there are different ways of filtering. The, the way I've chosen here for filtering is the intrusive way because I wanted to have it intrusive. That was the, the design goal of that. Um, but you can. The AST gives you gives you access to where where the information comes from, where this AST node actually is declared. So you can say, all right, this is a standard header. 